Up next, five underappreciated songs from the 1980s. We count them down, hidden gems that we don't hear as much, but they're so great. With interviews with the artists, you can rediscover treasures from Prince, Kenny Loggins, Billy Idol, and much, much more, next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Music is life. So subscribe to this channel below to get the stories from the artists every single day. Yeah, I can't believe how long it's been since we've done an 80s Hidden Gems segment, where we count down five seemingly passed over songs from the 80s that ought to be in more regular rotation in our lives. So we're gonna jump in the DeLorean and head back to the past right now for that. You know, we hear the same 50 or 60 songs from the 80s all the time when we're listening in playlists on streaming services or the radio or pop culture. And so today we're gonna to rediscover some ditties that are really great. I like to spotlight songs that while hits in their day, they just don't get their due, you don't hear them as much. So let's go ahead and do it. Number five, this group had two number one hits in a row in 85 going into 86. Their album, Welcome to the Real World, also hit number one in the middle of the search. Mr. Mister was on top of the world in the middle of the 80s with uh, their haunting ballad, one of my favorite songs ever, Broken Wings, with a spectacular bass line and the distinct vocal power of one Richard Page. Take these broken wings and learn Kyrie would uh, follow with its up-tempo healing chorus that sends us as listeners into a frenzy whenever it comes on, it does for me. I mean, it's impossible not to raise your fist and sing to the top of your lungs. As we've said in the past, you know, some have misheard the lyrics as carry a laser. Richard Page was in high demand before Mr. Mr. landed their knockout punch with that album, Welcome to the Real World. Uh, he was considered for the open slot for lead singer in Toto and Chicago. Mr. Mr., they were ironclad with the aforementioned Richard Page, as well as keyboardist Steve George, great co-writer, drummer Pat Mastoletto, and guitarist Steve Ferris, they were a great band. After their success of Broken Wings and Curie, they released their third consecutive top 10 hit from that album with our number five pick today on 80s Hidden Gems, Is It Love? Is it love, is it love yeah, I've always loved this song with its uh, genuinely 80s production. To me, it's just a delicious sing-along 80s jam that only, it just always brings back wonderful memories. I'm playing He-Man with my brother, trading Garbage Pell Kids drinking Capri Suns and listening to the radio blaring this top 10 hit in the summer of 86, I remember it well. It would reappear the next summer at the end credits of another underappreciated gem of the 80s, Stakeout with Emilio Estevez and Richard Dreyfus. Stakeout, who says a little danger can't be a lot of fun. I always loved that movie. You gotta go back and watch it again. So here's what Richard Page said about writing the songs for this album, Welcome to the Real World, and about this song, Is It Love Specifically? You know, I think most of us, when we write, we just write what's in our head, you know, and you, and a lot of times it's sort of time out of mind. It's not like you really have a specific goal or a specific idea. It's just like you're just trying to pull something together that makes sense. I say I love you. I hold you near me. You say I a lot of those songs, in spite of, uh, you know, me not really knowing what they were, became something, if I can say it like that, you know. It's gotta make you feel good as a writer that 30 years later, that those songs still mean something to so many people. Hey girl, I got to know, really you yeah. know? A lot of people out there. I think a lot of people are always looking for that, like, uh, tell us the big story behind it. And it's like, well, it just kind of happened, you know? That's <laughs> true. It is true. Sometimes you don't even know what's what's happening when you're writing. Is it love? Is it, is it love? Is it love? Another, because you said the two big singles, but it really was a third big single yeah, off of... it was top ten. It went number eight and using Stakeout. Tell me how that song came together. Um, that was just like a jam song, you know? I think Steve George had you know, that funk kind of thing going on in it. And... You know, we just all kind of pitched in and, and turned it into what it was. You know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like some 
iconic right. tune. You know, it was a con- it was a tune I think that sort of made it into the top ten on on the on the heels of of the, of other, the other two. two. You know. Coming in at number four, a song from a key member of the legendary band Fleetwood Mac. I guess you could make the argument that every member of Fleetwood Mac is a key member or was a key member, but I digress. You know, some of the members of the Mac, as you well know, took time to release solo material, especially in the 80s. Stevie Nicks had the most successful solo career so far, with quite a few hits, including four top tens, uh, two being duets. The number three hit, Stop Dragging My Heart Around, with the great Tom Petty. Stop dragging my heart around. Another with Don Henley, Leather and Lace, great song. The Prince-inspired Stand Back. And then later, Talk to Me. You can talk to me. Christine McVie also had a solo top 10 hit with Got a Hold on Me in 84. Got got a hold on me. And Lindsey Buckingham had a top 10 hit, which is our 80s gem pick. From his 1981 solo debut album, Law & Order, the spooky Fleetwood Mac-esque number nine hit, Trouble. This song is, is Lindsay at his best, you know, brandishing some haunting Spanish guitar feels. And when I say Fleetwood Mac-esque, I mean that this song sounds like it could have been on the Mac's album, Mirage. It has uh, that familiar Mac feel. Now for a solo project, Buckingham enlisted Mick Fleetwood to play on the track, play drums, uh, as he wanted a live feel for Trouble. But amazingly, Lindsay would choose to record a four second drum loop that he strung through the song. Uh, the song also featured the late great George Hawkins on bass guitar and had the memorable, silly Buckingham count off at the beginning. It also featured a truly breathtaking Buckingham Spanish guitar solo. I mean, talk about one of the truly underappreciated guitarists of all time, Lindsey Buckingham, just tremendous. This song uh, featured a very unique music video. It's very much worth watching and it's in that entirety. You can see that on YouTube. Trouble. Now, Trouble was a big hit outside of the US. It went to number 31 in the UK, but it hit number one in Australia and South Africa, finishing as uh, one of the top songs of the year in both of those places. Another Lindsey Buckingham solo hit that uh, has definitely stuck with us 80s kids all these years later is Time Bomb Town from uh, Back to the Future. I remember when Marty's like half asleep and he's talking to Doc on the phone. It's playing on his radio. Hello. Marty, you didn't fall asleep, did you? Which brings us to the number three spot. Billy Idol had many hits in the decade, from his first splash as a solo artist after fronting the band Generation X with Dancing With Myself, all the way to his live cover of Moni Moni. But one of his songs that just deserves more play and much more discussion is the enchanting, the very melancholy hit, Sweet Sixteen which hit number 20 on the charts in 1986. It has an equally chilling story. I had a chance to talk with Billy's intriguing guitarist and frequent writing partner, Steve Stevens, about Sweet 16, and here's what he related. Now, as we go into this, I wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the only glasses that I wear all the time. When you design and customize your own pair of glasses at zenny.com, you'll unleash your inner rock star. I mean, these frames are amazing. They truly are. And uh, you can get other great features like anti-fog and anti-glare. Grab a pair of these things at zenny.com. Here's Steve Stevens. Sweet 16 
You played on a song. It's got a very interesting backstory on that song. It was kind of based on a true story of uh, Edward Leedskalinen. I, I hope I'm saying his name right, but a, a Latvian uh, immigrant who single-handedly built the Coral Castle in Florida. In Florida, yeah. Set to marry Agnes uh, Skoofst. I don't know if I'm saying her name right, but she broke the engagement, and he decided to emigrate to America and built the Coral Castle there in dedication to her. It's an amazing song, amazing story. Tell me about that, how that came together. That's that's Billy, you know. Um, and, um, you know, once again, he finds the, he is the avid reader and he found this story or maybe, it, I think back then we were, I think Leonard Nimoy had a show called In Search Of. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. He saw it on In Search Of and he came in with the song and, uh, you know, sat down with an acoustic guitar and played it and said, you know, this is the story about this guy. And, um, and that, you know, that's great. So that's classic, great songwriting when somebody can come in with that. And, um, and, uh, and then really was just up to Keith and myself to pre you know, to keep, keep it intact and not screw it up, you know, <laughs> cause we didn't, we didn't want to change it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an acoustic guitar song and it's um it's a love song it's an homage to to lost love uh you don't really have to do too much to it you know to the more sometimes the more you embellish something the less emotional contact it'll have so we didn't want to lose that and it was kind of get out of the way of ourselves in the case of that you know well the magic that billy would bring it. I'm sure that was just incredible when he'd come in like with something like that. And just sing it because his vocal on that is so, I mean, he doesn't get enough credit as a vocalist. I, I agree. He's I agree. such a great vocalist. Yeah. And, and I'm in a good position to say that because I've worked with a lot of great singers, you know, I mean, I've been fortunate to work with the best of the best. And he's, to me, I mean, when I, you know, maybe because I've had such a long career with him, when I pick up a guitar and I play song, I hear his voice in my head, you know, I just cannot. And, um, and I, I think he's one of the, one of the greats. And, you know, I've, I've, I can't imagine how many shows I've done with him. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, I hear his voice and it's still, I, 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 you know, I still get, you know, goosebumps because it's, you know, he, he's a great classic singer, you know. And by the way, if you love this channel and you want to support our mission of getting more interviews on the stories behind the great songs, you can join our Patreon below where you will get uh, even more exclusive material. Now coming in at number two, His Majesty, the one and only Prince. The last hit from 1985, the satisfyingly strange number seven hip hop life. When Prince hit the top 10 with pop life from his uh, post Purple Rain album Around the World in a Day, uh, it became his eighth top 10 hit in a two year span. I mean, at that point, the only artist that can compare with Prince was Michael Jackson. Pop Life was very avant-garde for a hit single. I mean, the song begins uh, with a, a faded in synth line. Supported by just a suave bass guitar and a distinct piano piece. Pop Life was done before Prince had finished Purple Rain. It was kind of showing his band the revolution the way that he wanted to go after the soundtrack, I believe, and, and after the movie would finish. Around the World in a Day was a change in direction for Prince for sure. It was kind of a psychedelic synth pop explosion with Prince's magic touch. The song included the now famous breakdown where you know, we hear a bell ringing from a boxing match, the sounds of, of a blazing crowd, or you can actually hear someone yell, throw the bum out. Now the urban legend about this is that the sample was taken from a live concert from 1981, where Prince was the opener for the Rolling Stones that took place in LA. Uh, at that particular show, Prince was booed off the stage as he was just coming up and uh, pretty 
Mitch uh, not known at that moment. Now, Prince would walk off the tour a short time after, and who could blame him? Uh, this explanation was, as I said, in an urban legend, as the throw the bum out section. It was actually taken from a sound effects library, and it's been used in other mediums in pop culture. Actually, Prince has been asked why he included this in the song, and he's always insisted that he has no clue. Uh, in pop life, Prince speaks lyrically of being just unimpressed with his success, you know, taking shots at a world that has lost its way, as he says things like, what's the matter with your life? Is the poverty bringing you down? Is the mailman jerking you around? Did he put your million dollar check in someone else's box? In the chorus, he insinuates to keep yourself sane in this fallen world, everybody needs a thrill, but that everybody can't be on top in life. It ain't real funky unless it's got that pop. Pop life and around the world in a day, uh, very fascinating listens. Um, and worth a focus to listen, you know, meaning a great pair of headphones and your undivided attention. I've actually uh, been singing this song the last couple of weeks and you know, my kids are like, what is this song that you're singing? And I showed it to them and it's just an amazing slice of uh, psychedelic synth pop, like I said, from The Great Prince. And at number one, the lost single from the 1984 blockbuster Footloose, Kenny Loggins' other song from this popular soundtrack, I'm Free, Heaven Helps a Man. I'm Free went to number 22. It became the, the, the sixth top 40 hit from 1984's biggest selling movie soundtrack, which spent 10 weeks at number one on the album charts. It joined Purple Rain from Prince. and uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller. The only albums to log over two months at the top spot in what many consider, I, I included, myself included, excuse me, as the greatest year in the history of pop music. Kenny Loggins, otherwise known as the king of the movie soundtrack, uh, he was the first single out of the gate with the title song, Footloose. Now I gotta cut loose, Footloose. That spent a month at the top spot on the Billboard Hot 100, and it was the fourth biggest hit of that year. Denise Williams, she followed with another number one hit from the soundtrack. Let's hear it for the boy. That was followed by Bonnie Tyler's Holding Out for a Hero. That hit number 34. And then came Shalimar's Dancing in the Sheets. I love that song. That went to number 17. And then the love theme from the movie, Almost Paradise, the duet between uh, Ann Wilson of Heart and Mike Reno of Loverboy, are you kidding me? That went to number seven. Oh, almost paradise. Ending with I'm Free Heaven Helps the Man. Six hits, it's huge. I'm Free is it's a great song written by Kenny Loggins and the screenwriter and co-lyricist on all the Footloose hits, Dean Pitchford. And it was magnificently produced by Loggins and the great David Foster. It's just one of those songs where you hear it and you, know, you say like, oh yeah, I remember that song. What a great song. I forgot that Kenny Loggins even sang this. If you remember the music video, it actually featured actress Virginia Madsen. young Virginia, who starred in the film Sideways with Paul Giamatti later on. Uh, it's made a few appearances in pop culture as well. It's featured in an episode of Family Guy, as well as in Grand Theft Auto V as part of the playlist of uh, in-game radio station Los Santos Rock Radio, where actually Kenny Loggins is the DJ. Anything worth my love is worth a fight. I'm free by me. Now, I had a chance to ask Kenny Loggins about this hit in one of our many interviews, Actually, come to think of it, I think I asked him this in the interview that I did with him at the Lehigh Roller Mills where they actually filmed Footloose. That was really cool. Uh, if you remember that flour mill that uh, Kevin Bacon works at. He 
Here's what Kenny Loggins said about it. Again, written with Dean Pitchford, co-written. Um, I think we were, we were looking for something that would capture the emotion of that moment in the film. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm Free was the, was the kernel of that idea. Yeah. That, you know, how do we go? Actually, the, my, my funny story around that was that I knew that it had to be kids yelling, I'm free, because yeah. that was the essence of the movie. And, um, and so I, I brought in about a dozen 15, 16 year olds and, and, they, and I said, okay, I need you to yell, I'm free. And they're going, I'm free. I said, no, really yell it, I'm free. I said, no, just scream it. And they screamed, I'm free. And my ears went zing and I, <laughs> I couldn't hear the rest of the day. <laughs> it just totally blew my ears out. Well, there you have it. The top five hidden gems from that glorious decade that we all like to return to, at least I would, the 80s. Uh, what are your thoughts on these songs and artists for our top five hidden gems for this month? What are your memories? What are your top five hidden gems that you think that we ought to cover on here? We're going to get back to it. Let us know in the comments. If you dig this content, we would love to have you as a subscriber. Just click on the subscription button below. Hit the bell so you never miss out. Don't forget to check us out on Patreon. That helps us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. We'll talk to you very soon.